Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast presented in partnership with P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun. I wonder. <laughs> what is, are we going to start a podcast like that? I wonder. Welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. Uh, I'm Jamie Heath. And welcome to Man Enough. Indeed. And who are, you, <laughs> who are you channeling? Well, if you don't already know, from that, uh, I think, pitch perfect. Mm -hmm. um, Wonderful tone. Yeah. The whole thing. Vibrato. Yep, all of it. I was singing, mm -hmm. um, I was singing Shawn Mendes, because right. I am really excited that he is coming on the show today. <laughs> Apparently, I thought the whole world knows who he is, but I've learned recently that there are a few people in cracks of the earth that don't know who he is. So why don't we tell who he is for the few people Sean, who don't. Sean Mendez is one of the top five mm -hmm. biggest pop stars in the world, in the planet. His heart is as big as his fame. He's an incredible guy with a deep, deep soul. Young man, 22 years old. He's only 22 years old. And he was so willing and brave to come on the show. And you know, it, look, let's just be honest for a second. It's very hard when you're starting a podcast and you have an idea, because um, there's billions of podcasts, I feel like. There's just, they're everywhere. Like everybody's got a podcast. That's right. I feel like my my neighbor's grandmother has a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, oh, okay, I'm starting a podcast, but especially around masculinity mm -hmm. and this polarizing nuanced topic that affects all of us, yet we don't even realize it. And I reached out to Sean and it was like 100% yes. It was like an immediate response. Mm. And I think he showed up in the same way um, that he responded. Mm. He showed up 100% sincerely, authentically himself and was open to like feedback. And it was just a beautiful, powerful conversation. Well, I think that um, with Liz, because Liz Plank joins us and with her perspectives, her guidance, her questions, um, I think we really had a great conversation. With yeah, her. and I, uh, I'm excited for you to listen. So without further ado, uh, please enjoy Man enough. We'll be right back with Liz Plank, Jamie Heath, and Sean Mendez. And Justin Baldoni. Don't forget about you. Oh yeah. And me too. <laughs> Our amazing partner PNG aspires to build a better world where boys and girls, men and women of all backgrounds and abilities can learn, grow, succeed, and thrive with equal access and opportunity. Gender bias and stereotypes can get in the way of us truly seeing and treating each other as equals. This shows up everywhere. It's in our homes, it's in our schools, and it's in our workplaces. P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun, is dedicated to supporting communities like ours like Man Enough, where we undefine masculinity. See, undefining masculinity can help us create a more gender equal world where everyone has a shot at achieving their dreams. Now, our conversations on this show can become uncomfortable, but they cover a broad range of topics with guests sharing so many different points of view. And those points of view are so important because having these Uncomfortable conversations with influential people is so important, not just for the betterment of men, but for the entire world as a whole community. So thank you, PNG, for stepping up as a force for good in the world. Visit pggoodeveryday.com to learn more. Hello, and welcome to Man Enough. I am Justin Baldoni here with Jamie Heath and the amazing Liz Plank with a very <laughs> special guest brother Sean hey, Mendez how are you you need no introduction but let me let me do it just for fun uh Sean Mendez you got your start by posting song covers on Vine does anyone remember Vine? you're old enough to remember Vine right yes, <laughs> yes. I'm not, I'm no not nearly you, you never okay you have other things to do <laughs> back in, that, that was back in 2013 uh your first album topped the U.S. Billboard 200 charts making you one of only five artists to do this before the age of 18 ridiculous your second uh studio album illuminate also debuted at number one because you're sean mendes of course <laughs> and last of december you became the youngest male artist uh ever to top the billboard charts with four studio albums i've never had to actually like read because it's just so is it awkward for you incredible it's 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 it's, it's, it's uh i don't know what it is 
<laughs> I'm not even done, by the way. I'm, oh, okay? sorry. I'm, I'm just getting started. Your music and your videos have been streamed billions of times with a B. With a B. With a B. Uh, and you have an amazing partner. I do. That needs no introduction either. We hope she maybe comes on at one point. She'll be Camilla here. Cabello. She um, loves you guys. We love her too. So tell us why we're here. Why is he here? Why mm-hmm. did we invite mm-hmm. Sean Mendes? This guy that's... Um, All right. So there is a there is a backstory. Yeah. So um, I was writing the book. I was in a pretty... I was actually in kind of a dark place. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you felt this when you were writing your book, but it's strange to be like writing a book about being man enough mm. while not feeling man enough to write it. And I was having a day where I was like, why, why the hell am I doing this? Mm. I was like, is anybody, is any man going to actually read this? Is this only going to be like my, like the Ted talk where just women share it and then men bash on it. Mm -hmm. And I was just feeling super down and I had said some prayers and I was like trying to get past it. And then, and you know, and and when you're writing, you kind of like can apologize in your writing. So I was like writing and I'm like, no, I delete, delete. And then like my phone dings and it's like a DM from Sean Mendez. Mm. And I actually write about it in the book. I don't name you. And I asked your permission if I yeah, even yeah. Mm. You know when you, I don't know if you, it's like when you're saying a prayer, or you're meditating and you get this like ding and you get the answer that you mm. needed. And Sean DM'd me. Remember what you said? I just finished watching the TED talk that my girlfriend actually sent to me. Mm. And um, I was thinking about the women in my life and I was thinking about uh, my hairstylist and my stylist. And three days before we were shooting my album cover. So we were like nonstop shooting and it was like tons of moving parts. And and I was just like taking a real moment to just like, y- you said something about what what ends up happening is you end up hurting the, the women you love most, the women mm-hmm. closest to you, like your wife. And I thought about my girlfriend and my mom and my hairstylist and my makeup artist. And I thought about the last few days and how my team is a lot of men in it. and we can just be really bossy and kind of horrible, you know? And like, and I I like to think that my team is a bunch of amazing people. And I really do believe their hearts are so amazing, but in the middle of stress and when something is, it seems, seems to have all this pressure on it. um, It seems that they get the brunt of it, you know? And I, and I felt really horrible. So I messaged them. I just texted them being like, Hey guys, like, I just wanted to remind you like how important you are. And I know that like you guys just take the brunt of all of our stress and you're so tough and brave. And it's like, I was really thinking about it. It's like, if, if I was them, I would have quit, <laughs> you know, like multiple times. And um, they both replied basically being like, I'm in tears, like, you know, how much I needed to hear that. And that was a real kind of turning moment. So I texted my mom and I got the same reaction. And I was like, this is... um really kind of the main point this is what male privilege is you have no idea it's even happening until you know (laughs) and that and him doing that and messaging me on that day it makes me want to cry well here we go (laughs) because like i don't know like you don't know you don't know when you do something like when you're trying to reach men and then you're labeled like all the things (laughs) i've been labeled if you ever will reach men and the fact that like it reached you and then you had that response. And then even though a woman sent you the TED talk, which is what I go back to, is mm-hmm. like women influence us. Your girlfriend saw it, influenced you to watch it. And then you did that. And that gave me so much hope, mm. bro. Mm. That like a man with your privilege, you sit at the intersection of whiteness mm. and male privilege. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yet like you were willing to do that. And then you messaged me mm-hmm. at a place when I was, at a time when I like needed it the most and it, and it like gave me the strength to keep going mm. because everyone just thinks like, oh, all right, you're fine. You do this, you do this, you do a podcast, you write. And I'm sure people feel the same way about your music and you, Liz, and the same stuff. And nobody ever sees the iceberg. Nobody ever sees what's underneath mm-hmm. and like the self-doubt mm. and the wondering if this is all in vain and like if anyone will ever listen. So It's all in vain. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. And yeah, I, um, I think that I really, after that moment, realize my privilege in all senses like you said i'm at the intersection of of where the maximum amount of privilege lies Mm. and being able to even grow up with parents who allow me to explore these things and and explore my sensitivity and explore emotions even that they might not even understand from their generation um is privilege and it allows me to and there's something in your book that you actually said 
which I can't repeat exactly how you wrote, but um, you said something about how the amount of privilege I have more than than people who don't have means I have to work that much that harder. much harder than those people for equality, mm. and that changed my life. Like that, that was like there's days when you're working for clout for instance like as a, as a musician like you want to have a big song and you want people to think you're super talented you want people to think that you're amazing and and those days are are, are too often there's too many of those days mm. and um comes a moment where something kind of connects with you and you realize that you have so much more energy to work and stand up for something that's bigger than you well let me ask you something so you're a super impressive 22 year old talented I mean, we got your music in the house. <laughs> uh, my son's a big fan, as I am as well. I also come from your world, the music world. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, what you do as a young, amazing, privileged to be doing what you do, to be making money, to be white, and to not be female. Mm. Um, speaking a little bit of what you said, what do you feel that you are doing tangibly in our business, mm -hmm. which then will, of course, affect other parts. Well, this is something that needs to be talked about more. The work that you have to put into figuring out how to do your unique, specific purpose and what that means for you. You know, you don't, like somebody goes, you have to have purpose to, to be successful. Um, it's really hard to figure out what that purpose is and, and how you're going to help and make a change, you know? And I spent a lot of time, you know, working with uh, a friend of ours, Jay Shetty. Yeah, Jay's, about, Jay's coming on. Jay's coming on and yeah. he's amazing. And I think I talked to him about uh, this a lot. And I I think you have to really find where your strengths are and your kind of individual uh, method. Um, and something that I always have believed in and really has always kind of caused me anxiety in the same light because I, I never really wanted to follow it was, was telling the truth, you know, um, was, I mean, I'll be completely honest. When you're, when you start off in the music industry, you get a, a person who trains you to speak in front of media. Mm -hmm. They train you how to speak. They train you how to deflect questions that may make you look bad, although they need to be answered. They train you how to do this stuff mm -hmm. and you're scared. You're terrified to say the wrong thing. You're terrified so much so that you forget that saying the wrong thing leads you to being corrected, which leads you to mm. fighting for something bigger than yourself. Mm. And getting to that place has taken so many years and having so many amazing people around me, you know? So I'm really at the point now where like, I just wanna be, I wanna tell my truth and be corrected and then say that as my truth. And before you came mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. that's what, that's literally what he said. Yeah. He was like, I'm here to tell the truth. And yeah. I'm open to anything. And man, at 22, to be willing to do that. Okay, so what you just gave was wonderful. Yes. But still didn't quite answer. Tangibly, the amount of people who are listening, I wanna keep that to be able to spread the word to the most amount of people. So yes, for me, it's really about completely diving into uncomfortable conversations and uncomfortable situations where I can be corrected mm -hmm. so that I can learn. And then when the time comes to get onto Jimmy Fallon, I stand there with stillness in my body because I've been corrected. I know what it feels like to be uncomfortable and I know that I'm standing for something bigger than myself. So right now I'm mm -hmm. in the learning process and doing things like this, you know, like long form, conversations I think are so amazing for tackling big subjects. Mm -hmm. So learning, continuing to learn, and then realizing something that was um, told to me by Kez, my tour manager. Um, I was writing a caption for something and I, and, and I was like, people were like, the word, the word. And I was like, I don't know, should I switch the word? And he's like, look, you just always have to tell the truth. This is it. You cannot just lie because you're you're afraid of what people might think you have to tell your truth as it is and your truth might not be the right one but you will be corrected and that will become your new truth wow. and that's kind of where i stand Beautiful. now you know so mm. and is there a time where you were corrected or where you had that discomfort yeah i think it's it's not even necessarily having to be moments of they don't have to be these massive mm. kind of catalyst moments yeah. they're small moments i mean i remember at one point i i had this crazy belief that like 
because uh, I had a girlfriend in high school and she like struggled with her left and rights. And I was like, uh, she always had to hold up her hands before she turned left and right. And then I knew another couple of girls who did that too. And I was like, I th- and I remember saying this in front of my stylist and my makeup artist, I think women have a, a problem with left and rights. And they both were like, what? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I know. I really think like, like I did a study on it. Like I'm a scientist. <laughs> I knew like two girls who did this in the car mm. and that's why I believe that. And, mm. and then immediately I was like, that, that was definitely mm. not right. <laughs> and it's like, right, th- right. it didn't take them being like, you know, mm. this yeah. is a catalyst. It was a subtle feeling yeah. and mm. you can learn from that. Yeah. And yeah. I love that you, you know, this conversation between you and Justin pr- uh, prompted you to um, interact with the women in your life in a different way and, and sort of tackle that sexism that was, you know, either overt or covert. And what I also love about you (laughs) is that you also talk a lot about masculinity, right? For Mm -hmm. you, this isn't just about, you know, amplifying women and making sure that we treat and we respect women, but also I think you have a depth uh, Mm -hmm. of understanding of this conversation, which I did not have at the age of 22. Uh, And one way that I think it really Mm. shows up is in all these like gay rumors, these like Mm. so-called right gay rumors. Mm. First of all, one, uh, and and I heard you all talk about it and you were like, I don't know what to do with that because Mm -hmm. if I say, well, I'm not gay, then it's like, well, am I saying it's bad to be Mm -hmm. gay, right? And, And that's what's implied, you know, in the internalized homophobia in our society. But what I find really, uh, when I was listening to that, first of all, I hadn't never heard about that. And then I was mm. like listening to you naming the reasons mm. because you, you know, cross your legs, mm-hmm. you, you like are mm-hmm. conscious of how much space mm-hmm. you take. You have great hair, mm-hmm. you're calm, you're mm-hmm. nice, you're sensitive. And I was like, women love that. <laughs> like, like women are actually, those are all things that women are very attracted to. So who says that that's gay? But right? I also think most men would spend an extra little bit of time on their hair if they didn't, if they yeah. grew up in a house where their dad didn't tell them to stop fussing on their hair. Like my there dad could see me in the mirror playing with my hair and, and talking about my hair and he would never say anything about it. It was just mm, like, that's, that's a great point. You know, a lot. I know friends who like, they can't look at themselves for 10 seconds in the mirror because growing up, it was like, why are you looking at yourself? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like I said, that's the an, another layer of privilege. Like when I only talking about privilege, like I'm a mm-hmm. white male, but I also stand in a place where I was raised free to be sensitive. I was free mm-hmm. to at 20. That's why, you know, yeah. in another place, it's like when you go at 22, I didn't know these things. Mm-hmm. Like that isn't, that's another clear showing of my privilege right there to be able to at 17, be able to have these conversations and to, uh, have people really truly want to talk about these things with me you are listening to the man enough podcast we will be right back i believe that expectations based on gender which so many of us have heard since we were children are at the root of so many of society's illnesses today now i want to change that for my children's generation and their children's generation and the way to do that is with uncomfortable conversations My personal journey started with me looking in the mirror first and then talking with my friends, friends like Jamie and Liz. Now over the years, we've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations, many of which I look back on now and cringe, but that means that I'm a better person today because of the conversations I had yesterday, because I was willing to sit in that discomfort and listen. I wanna keep having those conversations and becoming a better human, and then share those conversations with the world through the Man Enough podcast. Our partner, P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun, shares that mission of creating a more equal world, a more just and equitable world where boys and girls, men and women, can all have equal access and opportunity to learn, grow, succeed, and thrive. I am so grateful for their partnership in bringing these conversations to light. Together, we can create a better world. All we gotta do is stay in the room. Visit pggoodeveryday.com to learn more about how P&G aims to make it easier to create a better tomorrow. All right. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. You do all this research on Sean and you find no problems, right? He's <laughs> fairly unproblematic, right? He's a Paul Rudd. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's what's interesting. And it just makes me like, it also makes me so sad mm. is how few, and I'm going to lump myself in there for the time being until 
you know, I become problematic or maybe this podcast will, something will happen. Mm -hmm. But, um, but how, how, how that's rare and Mm. like, like why that's so rare Mm -hmm. for us men to be quote unquote unproblematic, right? Mm -hmm. To have, to be at an intersection of privilege and yet to not have any scandals or, yeah, there's a lot of, um, clean. yeah, Yeah. totally. I mean, there's a lot of like, you know, like, I think we all have a very strong moral compass on the inside of our hearts. And like I going back to meditation, like the more you can clear your head, the more you're aware to that moral compass, Mm -hmm. you know? And there's a lot of things that people do out of courtesy and habit uh, like you guys have all done with me coming here, wh- whether it's, you know, c- commenting on how I look or commenting on how kind I am or, or commenting like on the successes I've had that is, is so habitual and so kind, but also adding to part of where that problem is, yeah. you know? And um, I think there's always this feeling that you get in your chest when somebody says something like, how have you not messed up? Mm. that you're like how is that statement really even okay. relevant because uh i feel like that all of a sudden makes the normal to mess up like to to be bad or to 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 yeah. make the wrong choices where it should be pushing towards you know mm. but it feels like i don't know how to explain that so totally. well i'm kind of butchering it no no, no, no you're explaining no. it well yeah. it's just some, it's something that i've for sure felt yeah instead of a pressure to be a good human mm. it's a pressure to not mess up mm. And I, and again, that's a longer conversation. Yeah. But I think it. But I think also what we what we can admit is that most men, all of us, are have not been perfect and have messed up past and have made big yeah, mistakes. Including I think, me. <laughs> and I think the biggest difference, and maybe the biggest difference is, is that um, you're willing or we're willing to mm. learn. Yeah. And to hear it, you know. And so, look, in the event a scandal happened or in the event something was came out, I'm imagining you'd address it head on. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And and the going back to privilege, we have the privilege to go head on with these yeah. things and the mm-hmm. privilege to talk about it. Like it's so complex. Life is so complex. And I think that the more you get into focusing on love, the more you just have this in, insane amount of compassion for everybody, no matter how horrible they may seem on the outside, because from like the a relationship you've had to your, the way your parents were to an uncle to a coach to a teacher to anybody in your life could have had a, a push mm. into into being that way you know what i mean and who controls that like why why is it that when i was in high school i had one teacher tell me that i had to play um rugby i had to be on the rugby team and i had another te- teacher tell me i can do whatever i want and i had another teacher tell me i can't play rugby because i can't mess up my pretty face because that's going to be what <laughs> makes me money like why is it that mm. the teacher that i ended up listening to was the one that was like you can kind of just do whatever like th- there's no reasons for these things it's just kind of the way things turn out and mm. There comes a point where something hits you like a catalyst and you're like okay well i get to start making the decisions from here on out on on what i learned about and how i confront it and that's the moment that it starts becoming very obvious that you can see people's privileges and Mm. the people that have been having an easier life and people that haven't Mm. because they will have a harder time telling the truth than i have Mm. because they've been hurt more than i have what kind of what kind of with all that what kind of man does that make you want to be ultimately i think especially with all the privilege that you have yeah how do you see like this is the man i want to walk and, and other men to look at me as. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like J- Justin talks about it in the book and he says there's this dying desire to have men approve of you. And that's like, you know, when you walk into a house and you don't drink alcohol, but a guy offers you a beer. Like <laughs> to turn down that beer is so hard. Yeah, man. Because you're like, I, that's such a disrespectful thing, you know? Um, and that's a, a one thing of so many ways of doing it. But for me, it's like, there's so much truth in being vulnerable and being successful in being vulnerable and being successful in fighting for equality and being successful in telling the truth. And I think that there's been this whole Americanized thing that has been like, we all have to be Superman. And, you know, this is why I, I, I completely love people like Jay, because you can see that Jay is like, I'm going to make being vulnerable and, and like people like you, I'm going to make being vulnerable and telling the truth, the new Superman. Yeah. And like that takes as much effort as the people put into making masculinity. Mm. You know what I mean? You mm. have to you, 
be working as hard or harder than the people harder, yeah. who worked for masculinity. And I've always been extremely driven, like massively driven. And the more I learn about how I can help, that drive just gets stronger and stronger because my fear lessens. Mm. I, I told Justin, I'm not a, I was never born into religion. I was kind of grown up as an atheist. My mom believed in God, but as I've gotten older, there's a faith and a belief in people's eyes when they, this is the simplest way I can put it, when they stand for something big, larger than themselves. And the more I connect with that mm. certainty that if I'm working towards helping others and working towards something bigger than me, literally I can sit here right now so much calmer and so much more fearless because I'm, I'm here for that. What terrifies you the most? What are you the most afraid of? So my, my girlfriend has this joke where she, she, she thinks I have this r legitimate thing where I cannot lie. Like I, I have, I'm incapable of lying. And it's kind of become funny, but also kind of weird for me because I, I know I can lie, you know, but also I do tell the truth to an extreme amount. Um, and, and so I, I get worried when I come on and talk, you know, cause I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, but I, I mean, feel that. Yeah. So I told her, I told her, um, the other day I said something, I, I, I raised my voice at her and she was like, I don't like when you raise your voice. Like, why did you raise your voice? And I got so defensive. I was like, I didn't raise, I, I wasn't like raising my voice at you. Like, and I did raise my voice at her and then. I felt her shrink and I felt me grow. And I was like, oh my God, this is like the worst. This is like, I'm so terrified of being evil. I'm so scared to be bad. I don't want to be bad. And I had to get in this massive conversation with her. Like I literally just got so defensive because I'm terrified of being called mm -hmm. evil or bad, mm -hmm. or maybe there even is bad inside of me. And I have mm -hmm. to just accept that that exists. And that other part of me, he, he's just got to be here and we just got to work together until eventually he gets worked in all of the trauma and all the kinks get rubbed out of him and mm. he's okay. But I can't avoid the fact that like, there's a little bit of darkness inside of me and mm. letting that darkness kind of be present is a horrible feeling. So I want to ask you, so that Liz doesn't have to ask you. I'm picking up on a couple of things, Liz. So that's sweet. Um, to share that. What I heard was you raised your voice. Yes. Which you don't want to do. No. She expressed her displeasure with it. Mm -hmm. You then became defensive. Mm -hmm. Did you move to apologizing and correcting it? Or did you make it about you and that now I don't want to be that and there's this evil in me and now she had to comfort you in your mm -hmm. that's what I did. doing? That's what I did. Mm -hmm. The second one. I made it about my my evil and my fear and she comforted me and then it took me like 20 minutes of us separately reading our books to be able to come back to her to be like God, that was a whole thing and I'm really sorry that's what we got to be better well, well that's right? yeah. but that's 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 well, we what don't... we got but 20 minutes mm -hmm. is like yeah, I'm trying to shorten that gap, you know, right. yeah. in like Good. and that's like a real con that's a thing we're aware of it. Oh, yeah, we're aware of it. Mm -hmm. You think you're you think you're being vulnerable and and, be, and saying the right thing, but you're really just defending yourself even better, mm -hmm. right? And and I think this is where this is so important, right? And and it can be really frustrating when you're having a conversation about hurting with 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 a man who you're in a relationship with, who you love, who's committed to this ideal of being a good guy. Mm -hmm. And I get it because there's so many bad guys, right? You're like, I'm not that guy. Mm -hmm. And I get that fear. Mm -hmm. You got it. You're right on. Right? You're right on. But then by being so um, committed Afraid, yeah. to being that good guy, you actually become the can bad become guy. the bad guy. Yep. But what I heard you say before, and it seems like maybe that's where you're transitioning to in terms of your masculinity and your identity, it seems like your masculinity is really connected to service. Mm. Mm, instead yeah. of an individual journey yeah. it's a journey that's like where am i going with other people i mean i think other people? for me the with the really extremely limited amount of knowledge i have about spirituality and service and what that consists of i um know that it's selfish because the more that i given that light the more i receive 
the thing that I always want, which is just to be calm and to just be feeling good, like, mm -hmm. and to feel okay, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I receive that the more I'm focusing on, like, uh, a bigger mm -hmm. thing than myself, you know? Right. This is really important to talk about because being committed to being that good guy, which I know, mm -hmm. I know the good guys. I, I know them. They have the same energy as me, and I can see it in their eyes. I can see the whole thing going on that can really make you the bad guy and, mm. and because you can become so manipulative in the As way the of being guy. the good guy. I think it's not about be the good guy. It's about like, let's get rid of this binary of good guy, bad guy, mm. right? And oh, like, yeah. just be yourself <sighs> in, is that hard? You took a, dip, a deep breath. I think that there's like, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm coming from my perspective. I really think that we all have like this, a big piece of darkness in us. Like, and we all have something being motivated from an ego dark place and, the more we try to act like that doesn't exist, mm, even yeah. if we're doing it in ways of meditation or prayer yeah. or anything, mm. the more we suppress it and it just becomes stronger when it does shine, mm, you right. know? Because you're you afraid of it, you're that, that it. The, yeah. In the Baha'i faith, we have this idea, and I know you and I have talked a bit about faith and your journey and my journey and shared quotes and yeah. stuff. And we have this idea of God has created us and we have a higher and lower nature. Mm. The lower nature, is this the material world i'm touching the desk it's it's our it's everything it's ego it's our ego mm. animalistic. it's it's the animalistic part of ourselves it's our lower nature mm -hmm. and i believe at least what we're taught is that it's about acknowledging your lower nature mm -hmm. yeah. and living in your higher nature which is the spirit mm. it's your heart it's mm -hmm. that connection between your heart and something greater than mm. yourself. It's living in service. It's not saying the lower nature doesn't exist. No. It's or is it saying that it's right. bad? Yeah, or is it, it is. Or is it, it saying is. it's not a binary? It's just, it just is. It the is. entire yeah. world has been created. Animals have a lower nature. Yet if you look at animals, mm -hmm. oftentimes they're better than humans, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But it's the higher nature. Well, animals stick to their nature. Animals mm -hmm. stick to their nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As we, we have a desire, I believe, human beings, to live in our higher nature, yet our lives become the battle of the two. So at the end of it, it's about acknowledging it and doing everything you can to wake up every day and to figure out how I can live in the higher nature while not also like hating myself mm -hmm. and judging myself and, and like living in my shame very, when I, when I, when I dip into my lower nature. Because if we look at the material world, the world as it, uh, in it uh, the entire world is set up to, to like, make us stay there. To make us stay in our yeah. lower nature. And, and by the way, I, that's such a good point. It's so gendered because women are encouraged to only be in their higher nature, right? We glamour, like motherhood, sure. and these are our saviors, but we treat them like shit and we don't pay them and we don't recognize their work, and, right? And But there are these like, right, higher goddesses. It's like superior gender that's supposed to just like do everything. Mm -hmm. And men are rewarded mm -hmm. when they act out of ego because but because they're uh considered like it's it's the same thing with the the darkness it's even like mm -hmm. watching game of thrones for instance like I, it's just like all men are uh indulging yeah. in rape and they're and and that's the that's the show yeah. and that's the system and the men who don't are like wow you are you must be a god in the right. show you know and mm -hmm. but it's actually such a statement for for what it yeah. is taking yeah. just like taking, taking everything we're rewarded yeah. killing hey, can i and... can i support this with data because mm -hmm. it's my favorite Please, thing to do, do it. one of my favorite uh pieces of data is on narcissism okay so narcissists the uh, 70 60 to 70 percent of people who are narcissists in our society are men but there is nothing that makes men that 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 that, that is biological or neurological uh, or hormonal uh, that makes men more likely to be narcissists, to be born narcissists. So in reality, an equal number of women and men are born with narcissism. Mm. But what happens is that our culture, I believe, this is the part that I think, I believe that our culture rewards men who are narcissists. narcissists. We mm. love. We do, of course mm. we they're do. Leaders. Mm. They're leaders. They're, they're the, for, they're the they Fortune 500. They know what they're doing. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And we do not reward women who are narcissists, mm. right? Even if you think about some of the most famous women I don't want to dr drop the Kardashians, but like they are business women. They're very famous, very successful, but they're called vain, right? Mm. They're they're diminished because mm. of their narcissism, if if that's what it, that is, or those traits that they exhibit. So it's really interesting how mm, we super. really set 
everyone up to fail, right? Yeah. And and if wow. we had a different culture, I would love if I could be like create a little petri dish of humans <laughs> and take out the the masculine, you know, the idealized masculinity, take out the sexism, take out the patriarchy, take out all those things and just see like would there be an equal amount of people who develop this? Mm. Um so 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 I'm just yeah, I think about that internal struggle that you're talking mm -hmm. about between whether you call it higher self, lower self, mm -hmm. darkness and lightness mm -hmm. and how like, yeah, masculinity confines you to the darkness mm -hmm. a little bit. And, and, mm. and I want to, I want to tie it back to something which I loved and I, I sing it over and over is, you know, you, you're starting to now tackle that in your music mm. a little bit, mm -hmm. which is really, really cool. You're finding a way to weave some of these themes that we're talking about here mm -hmm. into like pop songs. One of my favorite lines, and I'm going to butcher it, even though it's one of my favorite lines, is I butchered so many of I've your so much of your book already. No, you haven't. You actually uh, it, tr trust me. I felt insecure. You like said it better than I. I like wanted to go back and like shit. I should have wrote it the way Sean said it. The line about being conditioned. Uh, why when I cry in to my hands, in my hands, conditioned to feel like I'm, I'm less, less of a man. man. Yeah. And just that, it's so simple, mm. right? For like for like Liz Plank Every and feminist. Every man I know, by the way, has replied to me about that line. Right. Yeah. And it's such privately. a privately. Privately. Yeah. yeah, privately, very privately, which is interesting. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Which is, I mean, even you that's know. how even that's you how I reached out to you. That's how you mm -hmm. reached out to and me. And you but talk about your TED talk too, that you got all these mm -hmm. private messages. Oh yeah, men, so men dragged me. Mm -hmm. Facebook posted like the two minute version, which was like the mm -hmm. the, the like the Me Too part of it. Mm -hmm. Fifty million views later, mm -hmm. all men were dragging me, <laughs> and then privately it was like, Yo, bro, mm -hmm. hey. Man. This is the not all men I want. Thank not you. all men it's like not all are men. anti. It's not all men, but there's a but there's a public and a private, right? So yeah. anyway, yeah. so I want to know a little bit about what you're now doing with your music, and 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 are you going to do more of this? Yeah, is mean, this is yeah. this something you're exploring? What's that like? I mean, I jumped right into, you know, writing songs, and then I had a really huge song when I was really young, and then somehow wrote another really huge song when I was super young, and then another one after that and none of that was coming from a, a knowing place at least i had no idea what was going on it was just like all kind of happening only in the last like two years i've realized like the real uh power that comes that music is and there's something so interesting because i grew up kind of more or less atheist and now becoming much more spiritual and really being sure there's a god or sure there's a higher thing and there's a the universe or whatever you like to call it music was the thing that did that for me watching maverick city choir i think they're called maverick mm. city choir singing about god singing about jesus i'm sitting there watching this youtube video and they're singing about jesus and i just start crying like crying mm. my eyes out and i'm like i'm like you know when you're crying and it's like this is like something leaving me yeah mm. this is like that type of cry it's like you know and i'm like how is something that my whole life i've grown up to believe is fanatic and 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 not science and not the truth feel like home mm. because of this song. Mm. And then I started listening to um, uh, uh, hy um, not hymns, m like mantras, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, yeah. um, and the same feeling, this feeling of home. And I'm listening to mantras in the morning while I'm like stretching and I'm like, what? Is this thing like Kundalini type mantras? Kundal or well, like, or like, uh, like um, what are they called? I can't, I don't know exactly the word for them, but w just the songs, yeah. the songs yeah, from yeah. India, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, there's really truly a way that music gets to the soul and creates some, I'm stealing this from the words of Pharrell's uncle in the, in the mm -hmm. Netflix series that he just released. Sweet. He says, music makes words that people don't want to hear out loud in speech more palatable. That's right. Mm, it's, it's, it's so much easier to digest through song. Do you hope to change Ben with your music? I don't, I don't give, I'm not giving a pointed, uh, like who I want to change. I think my belief is that all humans are inherently good. I think we're all born inherently good. And I think from conditioning of life and trauma and whatever comes your way mm -hmm. kind of creates this version of you, whether yeah. you're happy with it or not. Um, and I think that like, like we were talking about music is the latter and if I can just give people that moment of intimacy and glimpse into their own self where they're like, Hey, I could maybe like just spark that little spark of light of reflection. Maybe they'll be like, Hey, maybe I should just like do this one little thing and change. Mm. Well, you know, I like the question that you asked about, you know, do you have a incentive to possibly change men or help men? And you want to help all people and touch people. 
But I'm going to challenge you with something. Um, because this is what I see. I see a dude right now that um, we need um, to, to be universally massive, mm. which you are doing. Mm. Why? Because the way that you sit in your skin, even though I know you have anxiety, which you've talked about it before, mm. I can see it sometimes. Yeah. The way that you f- you know, play uh-huh. with the microphone, uh-huh. those are all- They're anxious twitches. Those are all anxious yeah. twitches. They're- but you're here yeah. knowing that you have them yes. in front of a camera, making yes. it okay for other men and yes. other boys to think that's yes. a weakness. Yes. You're showing that you can be in that and you're still a man. Um, your humble posture and your sweet voice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and not this big, loud talk like I seem to always go to mm. <laughs> is manly, mm-hmm. is masculine as well. Mm-hmm. So to Liz's question, um, because you're a man and you're 22 mm-hmm. um, and you are saying that I'm finding God or finding a spirit, something mm-hmm. greater than yourself, uh-huh. you're giving other boys and other men permission mm-hmm to also search and to acknowledge and be humble. So I'm challenging you to find in your heart that yes, you want to touch all people, but but to know that you are indeed an influence on other men and boys. And I think that's so important that you said that to me, because I think like, I really do believe we all have our individual strengths and maybe mine lays there. You know, or one of them lays there, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, I really appreciate that. I, I, I take that to heart because it's it's uh it's just important to have that outside perspective too you know but um the privilege is 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 such is such a topic of conversation because so many people can't even break through the first barrier which is mm-hmm. is uh sometimes they say the wrong thing like they mm-hmm. like the smallest simplest thing you start thinking about the second you realize that you know we are all human and we make mistakes like so many people are so trapped in their conditioning that they cannot even get out mm. to do one step in the right direction. Mm. And how mm. do we break down that for people? How do we right. make that a common by thing? Saying, by you saying the wrong thing sometimes. By saying the wrong thing, And yeah. then showing up and saying, I said the wrong thing, yeah. and yet I'm still here, sure. and yeah. I'm gonna try to correct it and show that you don't have to run. <sighs> so that's what you do, you yeah. keep doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I'm, you. I'm wondering, you know, on the topic of your anxiety, I also have anxiety, but for women, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's almost like a, you know, a, a, my anxiety, like it, it's just, uh, more, more common it's, to talk about it's normal. it, right? It's, it's normal. Some, it's normalized. It's, at least. it's normalized. Um, I mean, it's still, you know, mental health is still difficult to talk about and, and still stigmatized, but mm-hmm. I think for, for men, it's even more, mm-hmm. right? Like there's even more stigma. And so I'm curious, um, did you always know? that you had because also anxiety is like presents itself in all these different ways until yeah. you figure out what's going on you're like oh this is what it is mm. was it difficult for you and, and do you think it's more difficult for men to sort of recognize how it shows up for them? I, I i mean i couldn't say i don't know i don't know how it is for you you know and and what anxiety is for women but i think as a man like i remember like i i really don't drink ever really anymore but when I was like 17, I would drink so much, like too much for a 17 year old. I was drinking like whiskey, like Mm. on my own in a hotel room. And I wrote about it and I have a song called In My Blood, which is the beginning of my conversation with anxiety. You wanted that for five feet apart. You wanted that, yeah. Yeah. And that was the beginning of of the conversation for me. And that was like, that was literally like, I, I, the beginning there, I'm laying on the bathroom floor I, I was laying on the bathroom floor, you know, I was literally like crying on the bathroom floor and mm. my parents would fly out instantly. And I'm sure that if they hear this or when they hear this, that, that, that will be heartbreaking for them to hear. But the masculinity in me did not let me call my mom or dad, you know? Um, mm. So I've been there. Man. Yeah. Mm. But it, it reminds me of my, like my struggle. Like, so I write about my struggle with porn mm-hmm. and in a very similar way, like it's normal. Like it's normal for dudes. It's almost it's like this unwritten thing. Like oh, it's it's like you're it's just pushed. Oh yeah. Like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Like, I remember my twelfth birthday. And that's they the tried thing. to 12th do twelfth his... birthday. Yeah. No, wait, yeah. wait, wait. Let's go into that. What what happened on your twelfth birthday? Oh, I just remember like the converse like twelve or twelve or thirteen birthday. We're sitting there and they're like, "Have you masturbated yet?" And this is like it's like funny, but it's funny because it's, it's, it's true. So uncomfortable to talk wait, who about. Who asked you that? My friends, like oh, my friends, friends yeah. you know. 
And I'm like, no, I have it. And it was like, you got to do that, man. You got to do that. What are you doing? And I'm like, what do you got to do? Well, here's the website and here's the thing. And like, go and get, use whatever and like go to the bathroom. And, wow. and it was like a com- it was like the conversation. Mm-hmm. Like I, I remember like it, I'm just thinking about my friends hearing this. They're going to die. But it's like <laughs> the daily conversations. Like, oh, did you did you masturbate today? I was like, yeah, I masturbate today. Of course not. I was like, oh, how many times do you masturbate a week? Uh, I don't know, like two, dude. That's very weird. You should be masturbating every day. What? Like, Whoa. like, I'm t- these are real conversations. This is not fake, and this is not only my friend group. I'm sure yeah. of that, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's a uh, that's crazy. So I remember. <laughs> yeah. So wow. so I had the opposite experience. Sweet. So well, I in some way. So I was introduced. I was introduced to porn when I was like ten. Yeah, that's so young. And and oh and the data is showing that year after year, um, that age is getting right. younger and younger. What can you, and like, how is that? It's, it's crazy. Well, because and you just flip because, through yeah. Safari or YouTube and it's, oh. it's just all there. It's, so with the advent of iPhones and all these things, you know, so you know, I'm 37 now, 15 years older than you. So for me, it was like, you know, the guys had, you know, yeah. dial up internet. So it's not like, you know, yeah, and it's it's but, I, but I was introduced by, to two other, by two other guys who were 10. Yeah. But I remember my, I write about this experience in my book is like, being kind of um shamed into uh into experiencing it before i was even ready like i couldn't even have an erection when i was like introduced to it and so and here are these guys they're a little bit older one of my friends with older brothers and he's got his dad's porn stash and all these things and and just like being thrown into something and Mm. being like oh Mm. like this is what you Mm. do this is what dudes Mm -hmm. do this is how you talk about women this is this is like what makes you a man you conquer right like you know have you hit that? And then Tony Porter talks a lot about like how language has evolved mm-hmm. and how it's like you how we smash, smash that, that. Mm-hmm. and how we and then how we're devaluing women through all. But we but we're not taught that. We're just taught that this is what makes you a man. Mm-hmm. So then you grow up, and when you feel anxiety or shame or all of the things that we feel. And by the way, I have clearly my nervous tick too thing. Jamie yeah. always calls me on like, we just keep the microphone in the same place, please. I'm like, no, Jamie, I'm nervous. Okay, and then he can't say anything. Uh, <laughs> But then you reach a point where then it, maybe it becomes a, an issue, right? Like your whiskey was. Mm. But I think what men experience, and I think the like invisible force that is masculinity is it's the thing that doesn't allow us to reach out and ask for help. Oh, yeah. It's the thing that made it impossible for me to tell my wife, who is the closest person in the world to me, and who had to take my buddies to Mexico. He was one of them. And still wasn't, still wasn't able to because I felt like, I couldn't share that mm. at that point. Like I was something wrong with me. It's crazy. And it's just like, what would have happened if you had that if, conversation? If we would have had the conversation, yeah. what would have happened if it if it was normal, like as normal for women to maybe talk about feelings and anxiety, I like mean, what you just said? Yeah, the comparison for women is interesting because it feels like men are thrown into being a sexual subject when they're still children, and women, Object. girls, are thrown into being a sexual object exactly. when they're still children, yeah. right? So I remember Jesus. the first time, you know, it's, it's a very different story, but yeah. I remember taking the bus and being in the second grade mm. and thinking, why are all these people staring at me? Is something wrong with me? Is there something in my teeth? Is there something in my hair? Am I wearing something weird? Yeah. And after a while, I started realizing, I remember like this vividly in the eight-year-old brain being like, oh, it's men. The men are staring at me. And I am a sexual, like I understood myself as a sexual being. And I wasn't, a, I, I wasn't ready for that, but I, that was imposed and does that on link, me. And that's then linked to negative, like so automatically yes. your sexuality or your body is linked to like negative feelings with Negative men. feelings. And, and also that's when I was, I was groped on the bus when I was eight by this mm. man. Like, like that's so when sorry. it starts, right? And, and so it's so, it's so, again, like everyone loses, right? Everybody like loses. you're a 10 year old boy being like shown this porn, being like, you don't have erections, you don't know how to masturbate. And I'm a 10 year old girl being, being Lord. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, can we just let everyone like, first of all, be children, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? And, and, and these gender, right? Like we talk about gender stereotypes. It's almost like it, it doesn't state the urgency of this. Like this to me is like, we're destroying like, yeah, ch- children. Purity, innocence. Yeah, exactly. And you know, one of the first times, one of the first times Emily, my wife told me about a very similar experience. She remembered 
walking, walking, I think it was just through school and having the boys start to say like these sexual things to her. Yeah. And she had no idea what it oh, was. And then, you don't even know what and it so then you just start. And so she started to like, mm -hmm. and, and you can only imagine. Smaller. So then here we are as adults, right? So I have my insecurities as it relates mm -hmm. to it she has mm -hmm. hers and now we're like yeah, yeah. and they're massively going against each other and yes. they're just like opposing and then we forces wonder. yeah and then it, we it wonder. sets us up to fail like it sets up our relationships to fail and we don't know where to talk who to talk about it with no one's ever so i don't i want to share something also because i talk about it often only for the reason especially when i'm someone like man enough about being not brave but that you're not less of a man so i was molested as i've said before from seven mm -hmm. no one to talk to about it for many years many many years and not until I was 49 did I like, maybe 48, did I like come out and really admit it. Before that, I used to own it because it made me more manly to be like, yeah, man, I was, when I was seven, I used to, I used wow. to, I used to play with this woman, you know? Mm. And, um, and when I was, well, there was a middle section that I didn't. And, and then when I was a little older, then the same exact thing. I had to own it. Mm even though things were happening to get to me yeah. um, because I, I would be too uh, weak or less mm -hmm. of a man to admit. Mm -hmm. um, but what I started learning, pain. but when you, when you own something and when you finally say it, like, and then you go, wait, I don't have to be a coward. Mm -hmm. I'm not cowardly. I'm take not, its power away. Take its power away. And since I say that out loud, there's a bunch of men that have come to me. that have been like, yeah, I was molested too. Mm -hmm. I was molested too. Oh, I don't have to, I don't have to walk with my back yeah. bent over anymore. Mm. Yeah. But it wasn't until, and it's funny being one of your best friends is, it's in the last five years that I've heard any of our friends say they, the, the men say they were molested. And it's, and again, it, com it comes down to like modeling it. Like you own it as an example, like with me with porn, I own it. And then suddenly it takes away some of its power, but then you start to see the effect that it has on all these other men who I believe, that's and that's point. why we're yeah. doing this podcast. I believe we are all dying inside <laughs> waiting for someone like Sean Mendez <laughs> to write something as simple as like, why is it that when I cry in my hands, am I conditioned to feel like I'm less of a man? There's even that little thing. I feel like we're waiting for permission to be like, I feel that. Or I'm waiting for permission. One in five boys are molested. We're waiting for permission to be like, oh my God, me too. Mm. What do I do about it? It's making me do this. I'm acting out. I'm, oh my, mm. I'm, I'm, I, I think I've become an abuser. What do I do about that now? How do I get help? Where, because you, you're trapped. You can't even get help. You can't. You don't know who to go to. You can't call your friends. Mm -hmm. You can't call your mom and your dad when you're on the floor mm. because you're drinking whiskey. So the question becomes, what do we do? Tell the what truth. What do we mm. do? You tell the truth. You yeah. keep telling your truth. That's all you can do. I think and not, it's not all you can do, but I think it's massively important because you sit here and you tell your truth and it lets somebody be like, I can tell mine. Mm -hmm. right. He can tell his truth. You know, like even even to like hear you say that, like got chills up my spine because I've never I've never heard, like, I I don't know how how old everyone is here or like even he's fifty one. You're fifty one. You're fifty one. It looks amazing. And and you and you just said that like deeply in in my heart. Like I I wasn't I wasn't expecting to hear fifty one year old say that ever. I was only expecting to hear people under the age of forty or even thirty five. You know, thirty five and like that moment of hearing you say that was kind of shocking to me mm. because of your age. And I think that that is, is like as much as boys need to hear it from, from me, 22 year olds need to hear it from me, 51 year olds need to hear it from you mm. so they can tell their sons, so they can have that conversation with their sons. And it's like, yeah, I mean, that's the beauty in it is the truth, you know? Mm. And uh, that's the, that's that, is a testament to this podcast mm -hmm. and and the the types of people you you're bringing together and the differences in the people and the similarities and you get everybody from every part of being human to tell their truth and hopefully it gives somebody who connects with that one mm -hmm. the option to tell theirs you know mm -hmm. but man oh. that's like so and it is brave it's brave it's so brave it's so and, and it deserves to be called brave you know like you're being brave to be vulnerable to like to confront these things like it is bravery and it's like it, it breaks my heart because it's like it's like the 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 thing that you cannot say these things like even sitting here like the amount i have to breathe into this conversation to be able to just let it flow mm. to be able to to speak the truth to be able to be okay with what i've already said like that is 
bravery like that that is being a man you know like and and that is that's the twist that you said on the thing yeah. in the book when you said you had to twist the i'm gonna be man enough to do this talk um it's just like it now now i'm thinking that's so funny how i'm saying this because that is like the conversation we're having it's using the word it's using the word against it's against, against itself, itself yeah right and i'm so happy that you see that and i think it's okay mm. to acknowledge like yeah the things that were the things that were congratulated as men for right unjustly and sometimes justly but the things that we are told make us brave are the very things that we're going to have to go up against and redefine for ourselves oh, yeah. to then go inward in order to stop the cycle mm -hmm. it's and like the only it's like the only way yeah. and then it makes me feel like so that we're acknowledging some bravery then it makes me think i'm saying you're brave for certain things you just said i'm brave for saying it but then i'm thinking of how many women say that they've been raped mm -hmm. <laughs> and yep. we don't call them brave mm. well that was what i was going to say mm. you know it's well not exactly i appreciate that you said that you know that it it to me when you're talking about you know we 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 need to redefine or undefine masculinity we need to celebrate compassion celebrate mindfulness you know we need to celebrate women who show mm. those qualities right That's because right. like yeah. the and this is where your liberation is tied to mine. Mm -hmm. And the more we celebrate women mm -hmm. who have the bravery to talk about sexual assault, to talk about rape, that liberates men to do it That's too. Exactly and right. everyone, gender non-binary people, trans people, everybody. Mm. And one of the things I, I am gleaning, and I, I, I know we have to wrap, so maybe I'll never know, but it seems like your life is better not worse Miles. by looking and staring into at whatever darkness, whatever we call it, ego or ingrained masculinity that you don't want. And, and I think that's the part we really need to talk about, mm -hmm. that yeah. men standing up for women does not take away from mm, their freedom. It right. adds to their mm -hmm. freedom. It does. Men letting go of the good guy identity and or the bad guy bi binary, uh, it doesn't just make your relationship, I'm sure, better in mm -hmm. that moment and in, in the long run, but also it makes you happier, mm. right? So, so I don't know, am I, am You're I right? You're completely right. Okay. <laughs> You're spot on. And I think that, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's like, that's like the whole thing. I always feel like if we're, we're, we're fighting to be like, uh, dive in and people are like, you, like, you don't, I guess we never really say that. We never really say like, Hey, like, by the way, if you dive in, it's going to be a little weird and dark. And, but once you get out the other side. I don't know if you ever really mm -hmm. do it, get out the other side or what, but like <laughs> you, once you get out, your life's better. Mm -hmm. Like th that, there's your, there's your re reward for diving in, you yeah. know, like you, you will feel better. Mm -hmm. You will be happier. And I guess if, I don't know, that's my goal in life is to be, is to be happy, is to find my happiness. And this is where it seems to lie, you know, and that, and that is also coming from someone who has achieved a lot of material success, you know? whether it's money, whether it's fame, whether it's like any type of uh, what you could read off of a list, none of that stuff has made me happy. It's mm -hmm. the thing that's making me happy is really just kind of being there for myself and being able to be there for myself by diving into the darkness and, and having these conversations. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of love in this room. You know, there's a lot of acceptance and a lot of caring eyes looking at you when you're telling your truth. That's not always the case for people. It's actually no rarely mm -hmm. the case for people and we have to be open that is what's happening you know most people tell them somebody their truth and that person's looking back at them like i don't want to hear this because i can't handle it because i don't want to yeah. tell you my truth mm -hmm. you know and so like this is also something like if you're listening to this podcast don't wait for people to listen to this podcast go and mm. give your friends those caring eyes they need from you you know if that's what this has done for you because that's the only way the domino effect's going to happen is if you give it to others, you know? And that's why I'm here, because someone gave it to me. I, I met you and, you and you gave me love, so I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna give love out. And if we continue to give that domino effect, that's how you change the world, hopefully, you know? Not As to be Buddha so, said, right? you know, exactly. One candle can lay, can lay all the thousands, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And be yeah. willing to do wow. the work, because before we started, mm -hmm. We had uh, said, like, sometimes we go deep in. Sometimes we keep it, like, cool, yeah. yeah. you know? And then sometimes it gets intense on the table. <laughs> and, you, and you said, I'm good with any of it. There's one theme I want to talk about before we get off, and that is, you know, I talk about success in the book. This idea of being successful enough. You're 20, you're 22, and you've had, you've hit 
what most musicians will never, ever, ever experience. You're one of the most famous musicians in the world. And you you have everything. And yet, what I find so fascinating about you in our conversations, not publicly, is how you have everything, yet the only thing that's lighting you up right now is your spirit, is, is, totally. is the thing that's nothing material, mm -hmm. right? It's that that idea of um, kind of letting, letting it all go, detachment from mm -hmm, the world. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, are you in a place right now where if you lost it all, if, like you said, if tomorrow nobody would want to hear your voice or what you had to say, yeah. would you still be happy? What's your journey with that? What's your journey with success right now? Yeah, I think if, if, if what I say is true, then yes. If what I say is, isn't, then no. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I hope and I believe it's true in my heart, but I, I really will not find out until it happens. And I think there would be a part of me that would mourn the ability to have a voice. Yeah. Although we all have the ability to have a voice. It doesn't have to be to millions to have one, you know, mm -hmm. we all, we all have one. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I think I, I feel like I have this insane amount of compassion and empathy for people on the other end of this listening right now being like, I would, I would be focused on everyone else and detaching from material things if I didn't have to work two jobs and mm -hmm. provide for my kids to eat every night. Like I have so much compassion for those people and I want to know what to say to them and I don't know what to say to them. And I, I am seeking those words and I'm seeking those conversations and, but, but I haven't found it yet. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I can take the rest of my life off. Rest, I, I'm good. You know, I don't have yeah. to work. Mm -hmm. That's not the case for everyone. Mm -hmm. And what can I say to those people and how can I, you know, and and, that's where I stand. And, and, the, and the thing that's so interesting about many of those people who I have a lot of those people in my life, I'm very grateful that I have so many of those types of people in my life is I've oftentimes found in my version of success, which is arguably less than yours in some ways that they're happier than me. Interesting. And, and it's the people that are able to find joy and not have all this stuff and not have to like figure out how to reinvent. And it's not to say that everyone's like that, it's not, but I have also found that success can be a barrier to happiness. And that was kind of like what I was directing myself with, sure. with you, which is because oh, we massive. have, because as men specifically, as a man, I'm fed the illusion that more success equals more happiness. Of course. That's, and it's an illusion. That's spot on. So yeah, so, the, so we're fed the illusion as men, and and uh, and I'm sure and there's women. an illusion, and and, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to speak on behalf of women, but as a man, I'm fed this illusion, and my dad suffered from it, and suffers from it, and I know his dad did that. With more success comes more happiness, mm. and then that's kind of what I was getting at: is you have all the success, and yet it seems like what's making you happy is is going in. Mm. Do you think that happiness is linked to success? Material success? Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. And I think Jim Carrey said it and a million other celebrities and famous and rich people have said it. And I think that it's impossible to make somebody who doesn't have what you have understand what it feels like to have what you have, you know, and that's where I sit. And, and that's why I, I need people to see my when I say it, look in my eyes when I say it and be there in the room with me when I say it. So you can feel the truth from it. But, you know, not to go on about it too much, but like I remember this chase for the the next hit this drive yeah. for the next hit i would be in my i had a condo i was 18 years old and i would basically go from instrument to instrument to my computer to my kitchen and i wouldn't eat and i wasn't playing anything i wasn't writing anything i was just having anxiety about creating something that was another hit and mm -hmm. I, I would go months doing that and wow. i would go months not replying to my mom's phone calls or my dad's phone calls and i would be mm -hmm. desperately unhappy the second I was able to like just start balancing, my happiness has just started flooding in, like flooding mm. in, in so many ways. And, and there's nothing more than, there's nothing more convincing that I can give anybody. It's just, that's it. It's mm. my experience has been chasing the material success left me very unhappy and chasing whatever this other thing is. Well, is, well is, I'm happy that you had said, before we started, we were having a conversation on the couch. And uh, we were talking about your beginnings and like the whole Vine experience and all yeah. that. And, um, and I had said something about your worth. Yes. Um, and you had said, um, yeah, I know my worth is not in that. Yes. It's not in a hit or no. any yeah. of that. 
No, and no. And that's really sweet to hear you say that stuff. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Welcome to this week's Man Enough Podcast Rapid Fire Questions, presented in partnership with P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun. All right, rapid fire questions. Hit me. <laughs> Here we go. Rapid fire. Well, and they're, they're, they're thoughtful. It's not just yes or yeah, no answers. they're good. Want to start, Liz? When was the last time that you cried? Um, uh, it was probably like a week and a half ago. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of the exact experience. I think I was just like bringing up a trauma of mine in a very manly way, <laughs> manly way <laughs> that wasn't very, it wasn't very open or clear to who I was bringing it up mm. to. And when I brought it up, it was, uh, kind of shut down to be not as substantial as their trauma was. Ooh. And I felt like really unheard by that. And then mm. it just kind of like, I didn't cry actually until we had the, conver the conversation about it. And then I was mm. like what's happening to me? I'm just mm. like, mm. these moments, it's like I said, these moments of something leaving your body. It's mm. like, I think as men, like we don't cry, but when, when we do, it's like, there's like, it's like a spiritual thing is yeah. leaving us. Cleansing. It's like yeah. crazy. So yeah, that was like a week and a half ago. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you apologized to someone? Um, this morning to my, my girlfriend. Um, you want to share anything? Yeah, sure. I was, I would, I think it was like, uh, the same raising my voice thing. I was downstairs and she left her yogurt outside. And I was like, I told her a few times, like, don't leave the yogurt outside because it's, I really want to eat that yogurt. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I, then I, then she was disappeared and she was upstairs and I was like, the yogurt. <laughs> and she was like, why'd you yell at me? I was like, I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm, I am excited about going on Justin's like, podcast. Yeah, I, I just, no, it was, I was like, I was eating the yogurt. Like, I just was like, I, all the mat, all of the ego and all of the, the masculinity came in. And I was like, she didn't pick up her yogurt. Who does she think she is? I'm the king. And then I yelled, wow. and that was that's the truth of what what happened. Wow. Good for you, yeah. <laughs> for for acknowledging, it's always in the small things. It's in the yogurt. It's in the it yogurt. Shows, it's in up the yogurt. In the yogurt. It shows up in the yogurt. You know, it's. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw I'm gonna go off book for a second. What would your girlfriend say is your greatest and weakest strength? My greatest strength, I think she would say, is my truth, like my ability to be honest and tell the truth. I think she would probably say my my weaker my weakest thing is is my commitment to being a good guy like we mm. talked about and you put it into words actually that I've never been able to articulate and I I really appreciate that because I think it's dead on committing committed to being only a good guy mm. makes me a bad guy sometimes. Mm. Mm. Um, you're 90 years of the future and you are visiting your own funeral, right? Mm. You're a ghost at your own funeral. Okay, I'm a ghost. Um, and everyone is there. Yes to celebrate you. Yeah. What would you like to hear from them? What would you like to be remembered as? What would you like to hear? I think that I have a deep knowing that I don't give people time, enough time as that they deserve, you know? Um, and, and I've made massive changes over the last year to give that time to people. Um, and I hope that they say he was always there when I needed him. That's kind of what would be the best thing I could hear, you know? Good one. And finally, what does it mean to be man enough? Oh, I mean, I wish that you asked me this two days ago before I came. <laughs> no, I mean, what does it mean to be man enough? I mean, well, this is the whole using the word against itself thing. I think you just got to be man enough to like my life. It, it's very relevant to me is it, it's really manly to mess up in front of people and be corrected. It's really manly to say the wrong thing and sit there through that uncomfort and admit you're wrong and then grow. Mm -hmm. That's like the manliest thing in the world because nothing shakes my core more than being corrected and having to sit there. Mm. Mm. Take one of those, mm. and then and then keep having that conversation. Mm. So I love that answer. Yeah. Thank you to our partners at PNG, the makers of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mister Clean, Pantene, and Braun, for helping to make the Man Enough podcast possible, and for sponsoring these fun and real moments with our guests. Will you do me a favor? Yeah. Um, you don't have to say yes now. Okay. Just in your mind. Yeah. Um, 
you're so, um, there are so many boys and girls that love you. And there are so many girls that love you. And there are so many black girls that love you. Mm. Many that I know. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing your concerts Mm -hmm. and you're doing your stuff, um, I don't know where you stand in all this, Mm -hmm. but um, look at a black girl sometime. Promise. And and let them know that you see them. I hear you. Mm. I hear you deeply, yeah. All right, brother. Yeah. Sean, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, guys. My brother. What an amazing opportunity you and experience. Thank you. are man enough. Thank you. <laughs> you sure are. I man. love it. I feel, like, I feel like I'm on a spiritual high. Yeah, me too. Uh, yes, sir. If you like what you heard, uh, please check us out at manenough.com slash podcast. We'll be right back with a little recap. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Jamie Heath. And I am Liz Plank. And this is Man Enough. Welcome back to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Jamie Heath. Oh, I'm Liz Plank. <laughs> Forgot. Wow. Are we that? I like, would, are we that? Yes. I, uh, no, yeah. I was just Sean, listening. I was listening. Sean Mendez made you forget your name. Sean Mendez made me forget my name. <laughs> yes. That's the least uh, that happened. I, I, I feel... Um, so hopeful. Mm, me too. Mm. And I wanted to ask him, but I was like, this is a basic boring question. And also we had a flow and I didn't want to disrupt it. Mm. But I, at one point, you know, he was talking about his age and versus, you know. My age. Your age. Uh, and <laughs> I, I just thought there was a, a really interesting, what, what I saw there was like, oh, wow, there's a next generation yeah. that's going me to too. be tackling this issue in a completely different way. And who we can also lead uh who, who we can follow as they lead us right yeah. and so i i loved uh i loved that conversation i loved how he was so confused when jamie said at 49 <laughs> <laughs> well i'm 51 i was but, making but reference he, to he, when i was 49 but and... i just want to just just you know i just want to give you a compliment what's he that? was i saw his brain kind of explode <laughs> he was like wait how if he was 49 when he found out, how old must he be yeah. now? I, I think he thought you were like maybe 40. Oh, you mean to begin with? Yeah. I don't know. So you look really good, man. You look wow. Great. You know what? Um, on a set with, I mean, <laughs> hello, Liz. Look at this wonderful, No one can see. No one knows. No, people can see. They can see <laughs> in their minds. And, and then Justin, Justin, I got to sit next to Hercules. Yeah. All right. right here. So Sean, I just so appreciate his bravery to be in this position, I mean, to be one of the most famous people in the world mm. and be willing to hear feedback and be willing to be like, cause, cause he has everything to lose. Yeah. If you think about it. Yeah. And um, at that intersection of privilege and he's like, no, but that's not fulfilling. Mm. I want to sit at the table with you. And I, and I also love the very last thing because you've done that to me so many times where you've in your Jamie way, open my eyes and my mind to something. And and I have to believe you just did that for him. When you said, I got a lot of young black fans, just do me a favor. And you don't have to say yes. Just, just when you're out there, when you're singing, just, just look at one of them. Just see, and I just know, I know he's going to do that. And I guarantee you knowing the man that he is, it's going to, it's going to end up being much more than that. Cause that's what you do. You plant seeds in people and you, and you help us grow as you do as certainly Liz does. uh, I loved that he was able to, um, you know, admit or not, I don't know if admit is it, but just come true with some of the stuff that he's working through, how he stumbles, how he talked about how he yells at his girlfriend sometimes and about the yogurt, about the yogurt. And then he he admits that that he's dumb for it. And then, and then he says, and then he kind of goes back to like his, masculinity and how there's this but then he's willing to like learn and listen and then liz you like will share something and then he'll like acknowledge yeah. it and say you're spot on well the good, he's not saying the good guy, guy thing but... was really i could see mm. that was really important for him like i mm. like he's going to take that with him the idea mm. of trying so hard to be a good guy makes him a bad guy yeah like that's fascinating yeah and i for sure have that yeah you have that and if I we for, can 100 i have that I, yeah. and if we can get guys at 22 right imagine if you had learned that when you were 22 Oh my God. <laughs> I'm not like, I just, I, yeah. And that's mm. one of the things I'm so bummed about. It's one of the reasons why I wrote the book is because mm. it's like, where is it? Mm. Where, where are the, the relatively, <laughs> the relatively young guys who are talking about this, who are willing to just be wrong mm. and go out there. And I just love that he can maybe represent 
um, the next generation yeah. of, he does. of of what it looks like to be brave enough. Mm. He's four years older than my son, who's 18, and the idea that, you know, that's generally in the same age group um, that my son, because I've known Sean, we all know Sean and his music. Yeah. yeah, and what he does, and you know how he talks in the world. But when you see him right here in his in his humanity, I think, oh, I want him to win. Yeah, yeah. I want him to win because he'll allow other people to win. Yeah, you know. And with that, um, thank you so much for tuning in to Man Enough. Uh, if you like the conversation, uh, check us out at manenough.com slash podcast, and you can follow us at We Are Man Enough on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. and maybe even TikTok. <laughs> no, if we have by the one. time by the time this comes, this comes out, out we, Liz will. will have yeah. we will have gone viral on TikTok. Thanks to Liz Plank. <laughs> thanks to Liz Plank, who's uh, the badass? Who well. is the badass? And Liz, thank you for again being willing to sit at this table mm -hmm. with men mm. and offer your alternative perspectives mm. and perspectives as a woman. We could not be on this journey without you. The show would not be anything without you. And we appreciate you so much. Mm -hmm. I can I say that I felt. A, I felt like you had my back so much in that interview and so much so that you read my mind. Afterwards, we were like, I think we're now psychically connected. Like we, um, both of you asked questions that I was thinking about and I was like, okay, maybe I'll, I'll jump in. And then you jumped in and you asked that question instead of me. Mm. And you challenged Sean instead of me challenging Sean because that's the thing too. I don't, like having to you know yeah go on like right like and seeing a man do it to another man even though there's a woman in the in the room mm. is is uh that's it that's the thing well every day we're getting better and i have a feeling that this podcast is going to show us evolving and making mistakes and evolving yeah. and making mistakes and evolving but and making mistakes ultimately we are in this together yeah. and we have mm. to win yeah yes. so we have to find ways right. to uh -huh. start reading each other and our mind. happiness is tied together yes. right yes it is indeed and so is our liberation so is our mm. liberation which equals happiness yes at the end of the day mm -hmm. thank you for listening to man enough we'll see you next time i'm justin baldoni i'm liz plank and i'm jamie heath and this is man, man enough, enough.